Okay, welcome. <laughs> welcome, welcome. This is our um, very special time with Melissa Michaels in our shadow course. And um, hi, Melissa, thanks for being here. An honor and joy. And um, gosh. So Melissa, for all of you in our in our course and, and tuning in, Melissa is my teacher, my mentor, confidant, one of all of just dearest aunties. And um, it is a real just honor to have you here. And if you've received any kind of um, insight or wisdom as a result of being in a course with me, I can guarantee you that if you trace it, you will see Melissa and her work in that. Um, deeply inspired um, by her work, and she is um, just a, a, a huge pinnacle or, or piece of what, what I'm up to, and, um, and it's just really an honor to have um, my elder and, and teacher and just give you the direct message. Um, and I just want to also mention um, a lot of the work that you've experienced through me uh, in some ways is finally now Melissa has a book I can put on her or on our reading list. Hallelujah. I can just cite this baby. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yay, finally. And um, this is an incredible, um, just an incredible book and such a gift to anyone who is uh, working with different stages of life, working with any initiatory processes with which, as we of course know, yoga is a part of. And um, let me read to you, I love the, just this little bit about Melissa from her book. It will be a little more formal. So Melissa Michaels guides individuals and communities through major life transitions as a soul midwife and mentor to emerging leaders around the world. She has created Surfing the Creative, a rite of passage linking somatics, youth development, and peace building. Youth on Fire tells the story of this life-changing work as it has unfolded in diverse settings ranging from inner city schools to college campuses from ref refugee settlements to the United Nations. So thank you for your work and your contribution. And, um, and I can speak at length about, the, about surfing the creative and what it has done for me. Um, but I was, we always start with our, when in our classes with just a little centering, a moment to drop in. So would you like to, guide us in that? Olivia? Sure. So wherever we all are sitting or standing, just take a moment and wiggle our toes and allow ourselves to, we can close our eyes or leave them half masked so that we're beginning to gaze within while also focusing on the faces and the voices outside of ourselves. And as we gaze within, let's also let ourselves really lean into the wall or the chair or the cushion or the floor that you're standing on, but to really give your weight to what is concrete and supporting you. And as you do that, to just notice what it's like to make contact with something solid. Maybe you notice a relaxation in your eyes or your jaw. Maybe you notice your breath dropping down into your belly, expanding and contracting. Maybe you notice a pleasure, a, a sensation that you might call pleasure, warmth. Or you can feel the pinching in your shoulder, a, pleasure, a sensation we might call discomfort or pain. Just to 
allow ourselves to soften our jaws. Notice our breath. Hear it. We can feel it inside moving. But just let ourselves relax into our beings in whatever state we find ourselves in. Do we notice a twitch in the eye or saliva in our jaws or uh, burning in our legs or pulsing in our heart? As we do that, to just ask your sweet body being, do you need to make contact with yourself anywhere? Would it feel good to put your hand on your forehead or on your heart face or maybe on your sweet cheeks? To let the warm palm of your hands make contact with the back of your neck or just someplace that feels maybe vulnerable or you're just digesting lunch or you've been doing a lot of yoga and your hip Flexors need a little bit of just contact to feel supported, to be able to relax into whatever they are. And just to say hello to your body being. <laughs> hello, I'm here with you. All the way down and be sure to really greet your feet. And if you were to make a shape that just says, yeah, I'm here, I'm, I'm leaning into the wall or I'm standing tall on the floor, or I'm reaching out and breathing in the fresh air that's coming in. We're here in Colorado and it's a warm day. Some of you might be on the East Coast and it's cold. Just what is a shape that just feels nourishing and true, authentically you right now in wherever you're standing or sitting, or maybe even lying. But to be there, to be there in your head, your throat, your heart face, your shoulders, out through your wings, down through your spine, your organs, creation, digestion, elimination, even your pelvic floor, which I'm sure Liv speaks about, just to really root in ourselves down to the soles of our feet. From that place, to take a moment and come back to your senses, tasting the remnants of whatever you last eaten or drank. Hearing the sound, we just had this big burst of wind pass through. Hearing that, really receiving that. What's, what are the smells around you? Time to make contact with our bodies. Where do your hands want to rest or pet or pat while we're together? And as you're ready, just to gently open your eyes and they aren't already and say hi to each other and just notice the beauty or whatever you see before you. Get to look at Livia and myself. It's <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> And these beautiful roses behind my head that a friend made for me. Okay, thanks, Liv. Thanks for that. Good to be here a little more fully with you here. Thank you. So, our course in the shadow is um, this year, we've been learning a lot about theoretical concepts of the shadow, but really focusing on uh, the difference of our, well, focusing on the body, so ways that, and ways that we decide or not, basically decide or we've chosen not to embody, um, related also to how we are perceiving ourselves from the inside, but also how we're showing ourselves on the outside. So sort of like yoga in the digital age, you know, now things on social media and whatnot. And then also through the life cycle, we've got people in our class from 
I would say probably 25 to 55. Um, we have moms, we have folks who aren't moms, we have people who um, live in the country, people who live in the city, we have um, even in our small group just a lot of diversity in that arena and um, and I know that you're such a an ex well hold a lot of wisdom I want to use the word the term hold a lot of wisdom instead of ne necessarily an expert um, but you just have a lot to share in terms of how embodiment period but also the ways that it presents as we grow and change through our life and then even more so as a woman um, and what that's like and the shadows that can come along with that. And I'd love to just hear um, anything that you care to share with us on that topic. Favorite topics all woven together. Thanks, Livia. Um, well, I'll just say that my academic doctoral work is really focused on the adolescent developmental cycle of life, which is that period that, depending on time and history and culture, is the period between childhood and adulthood. And in some cultures, it was an instant. And in other cultures, like what we're experiencing right now, it sometimes can go on for from 14 to 28 if all goes well. We also see that adolescence can last well into one's uh, older years <laughs> based on um, how things went leading up to the adolescent and through the adolescent. So I have a lot of expertise there, but it really all comes back to early developmental processes and how that goes as to um, how we navigate our way into a whole and productive adulthood and ultimately um, elegant aging and el elegant eldering, that's a new word. So what I'd love to do is just spend some time talking about each of the life cycles. There's so much to be said. There are people who have devoted their lives to each of these life cycles or a year within them. But just to touch upon them from the perspective of embodiment and the power and the gifts of those developmental cycles and the shadow of what happens when we aren't able to fully incarnate and um, uh, have the develop meet the developmental mandate of that particular cycle of life. So I, I'm going to make just a little tour from um, conception through death, from my humble perspective. And I'm schooled through my own life, of course. I'm schooled through um, deep study with, with a number of different lineages. Obviously, I'm first generation teacher of the maps of Gabrielle Roth, who worked with a developmental map through her five rhythms that I will touch upon as I'm speaking. And they've shaped very much my thinking. And infused in that has been the work of Rudolf Steiner, whose very intricate understanding of human development um, has allowed me to expand the um, overarching mapping that Gabrielle did. And with that, Bill Plotkin's map of human development and um, and others have informed my work. But really, um, my mothering and my working with thousands and thousands of human beings throughout the life cycles have been some of my greatest teachers about what's so and the power of embodiment for helping people meet the developmental mandates of each of our life cycles. So that's a little bit of where I come from. And, um, as we go through, I'll share stories from my own life personally and also from my work. So we know that um, conception is not a random phenomenon, although for much of humanity, it's often a pretty unconscious moment when ideally two people come together and make love. And in that love making, something new gets created. And in an optimal situation, 
they both are connected to the fertility happening in their bodies and they consciously choose to come together literally come together but also metaphorically at a time if their intention is to create new life when there's optimal opportunity for that where she's ovulating and and there's men have cycles too and I'm not an expert on that in any way but there are cycles and they say that they're every 72 hours is it hours or days 72 hours that a man mm-hmm. you know I'm I, I, what is that oh. I think anyway I am not going to even pretend to be an expert on the men but the men have their own cycles obviously dirty little secret I did not conceive either of my children consciously which is partially why I am doing the work that I do which is to help people come back into rhythm and start to track their own rhythms. And there are men who've come up through this work who've taken this up very deeply. So at conception, if we are conscious, I've heard many stories, including the conception of one of my children, when when there's the sense of a third of the spirit of this child, of this new being coming into the field of the yin and the yang, the mother and the father. And of course, there are many ways to properly uh, actually now conceive and grow children. Um, But in a really traditional way, it's the egg and the sperm of a masculine and feminine being that come together. And ultimately, there does need to be the union of egg and sperm. So conception is one of these times that um, can happen with so much awareness of one's internal landscape, both one's cycles, one's desires, one's connection to the pleasure and power of communion with another, and places where we are literally making love and sharing and exchanging that in the creation of new life. So for the for most of us, that's not how we created new life, if we've been so blessed to be able to do so. And there's not a whole lot wrong with it. We just get to wake up through the act of creation. And both of my children were conceived with um, in situations that were not necessarily deeply supportive of me as a woman or a family that we were creating together. And through the act of creation, there was a lot of a waking up and having to turn towards the very serious mandate of consciously gestating and growing another life. So my pregnancies, um, there were eight years between them, were really powerful opportunities for me to begin to move out of my highly dysregulated, disconnected state as a young single mom with my first child and as a, as a healing woman with my second, um, so that I could come into relationship with this growing child. So great spirit, the grand design gives us nine months to grow a human being. And not only does the gestating human need that, but the adults around that child really need it too. And we have another opportunity to wake up and come into connection with the miracle of the spiritual world coming into form either through us or through the um, woman who we have um, inseminated if we are the father. And um, embodiment practices at any point along the way are advantageous, at least, and radically life-giving at best. And with my firstborn, um, I started dancing a little bit in that pregnancy. I had a longing to do it. I was not a dancer. I had no relationship with my body. My adolescence had been filled with use and abuse of substance. I was a very disassociated young woman and at 22 I got pregnant and that was really my wake-up call to begin to make the journey into relationship with this body that was now gestating this new life so um, between the birth of my two year my two children in those eight years after having a very significant birth experience which I'll tell you about in a minute I devoted my life 
to coming into the body because I realized that without that, I was not going to create for my daughter a different experience than I had had. So the field around a family and a gestating woman is so significant in, in, in their and her in particular capacity um, to come into her body. If there is safety, if there's enough food, if there's protection from um, negativity that can just be, you know, people's attitudes, but it can be in the world we live in now, it can be war, it can be, um, it can be poverty, it can be conflict in the family, it can be you know, disruption in so many ways. And the sense of safety that a woman has has everything to do with her capacity to settle down and just be, which is her mandate with this growing child within. And certainly women can work through their pregnancy, and most of us really delight in the opportunity to stay in community and continuing to grow our careers or generate income, but um, there is also this this looks within that allows the relationship to begin to deepen and a bond to form and an attunement to come online between the mother and ideally the father and the growing child. And you know, for some of us, and I had this certainly with my second born, and I'm sure you did too, Liv. It's a very intimate relationship. And the more we are in our bodies, in relationship with our own sensations, our own emotions, and the images arising from the cells and the souls of our being, the more we're able to differentiate ourselves from the child growing within and also really attune to this miracle of life happening within us. And there is it's so much subtlety to pay attention to from the discomfort of our ligaments or our, our um, oh my God, our psoas muscles to the um, warmth and pulsating and pleasure that comes from really our yonis growing, having more blood in them to our bellies expanding in size to the literal life force of this child expanding within us. and um, I can't encourage women enough to do everything they can to dive into the miracle of new life forming within them because it really is a kiss from the spiritual world in our body. And um, it can be scary, all the fears that arise, to be with them, to befriend them, not to let them consume us, but to come to understand yeah, our identities are changing. We are leaving behind the maiden. We are moving into a fuller expression of ourselves as women. The men in our lives or our partners are also going through their own identity changes because the one who they made love with, ideally, or the one who they conceived new life with is changing in every possible way. Her temperament is changing. Her needs are changing. Her appetites are changing. Some of us are deeply interested in being extremely sexual during our pregnancies or different phases of our pregnancies. And others of us are just, no thank you. And none of it is right or wrong. It's just different. And each child brings with it a whole different deal. I mean, my two kids couldn't have been more different around that. And I, of course, was very different. But there's a revolution happening in the body for this child, for the woman, and for the whole system around this, this growing human. So, um, dirty little secrets. Um, well, one, and probably you've already spoken to this, Livia, pregnancy can be an incredibly erotic time. I really, I healed so much from my early biography of abuse with my second born. I just had an er erotic revolution in my body. I, I was, there was so much energy that I was able to um, be with that had finally liberated, that I really couldn't access in my contracted state of being a terrified um, young person and young single mom with my firstborn. And you can see it in the nervous systems of my two kids. It's like two different humans gestated that those kids, and in some ways it was. Um, you know, the 
very intense work throughout parenting and and going through the journey of creating new life and raising new life is it's no tea party it as i say in this article i wrote it's a giveaway ceremony we have to we have the opportunity to befriend everything unresolved in our own biographies so whatever what is up for me as a gestating child for me as an infant for me as a um, lip, as a baby but got brought to my unconscious and ever more conscious awareness during those cycles of parenting and um, it's a lot it's a big job if we want to take that up and transform it and of course out of our love for our children we so want to transform our biography so that they have more freedom going forward and some people are blessed to have their families of origin be there with them in the deconstructive of what happened in the asking of questions in the peacemaking and other people really don't and um, I also want to say that even if you grew up and gestated in genocide and didn't have your parents raising you, you can still be a brilliant and far out and connected mom or parent or auntie. Um, this, the, our past does not necessarily mandate our present and our future because there are many ways to heal that wound. And for, for so many people, nature is the place in the lap and the womb of the Mother Earth, they're able to reset their nervous systems, to remember that they are part of the great wholeness and the unconditional love of the universe. For me, it, wasn't, it was somewhat the Earth, but it was also spiritual teachers. I had a teacher named the Mother. I mean, duh, what was I looking for? And I, I accessed this sort of, universal archetypal energy of the great mother when I'd be up at night nursing my kids and just trying to figure out how I was going to keep going I just was bathed in this love so we each have our own story we each have our own path here if we never parent children we are always conceiving and gestating and birthing things into the world and the beautiful thing about a path of embodiment is it gives us the opportunity to get present with it, to become even more attuned and connected and, and in relationship with that which we are bringing to the world and growing. So, um, you know, I'm, I love this metaphor of the seasonal spirit seeds new ideas in the winter and then they start to come into the earth in spring and we plant it into the soil and that could be implantation in our body or we plant it into the soil and it grows through the seasons of spring and summer and we harvest that in the fall and allow it to recede into the late autumn and the winter so it can happen seasonally it can happen through our menstrual cycles there are the seasons through our cycles and there are, of course, the seasons through growing, growing life and living life. So I'm going to stay on that track, but I just want to take it out of, oh, it's, this is only about parenting. It's also about reparenting ourselves. And so much of the work for so many of us longing to have this powerhouse turned on inside our bodies, it is about reparenting ourselves. Because whether we have alcoholic parents and workaholic you know, alcoholic mothers and workaholic fathers and, you know, fathers who were invested in the empire and totally disassociated and didn't value our creativity or our hairy bodies or whatever. That's a little bit of my story that I just plopped in through all that. Um, we can heal all that. And actually, I feel like we have a serious responsibility to do so, especially those of us that live lives of fairly safe existences. We have the opportunity to rest at night, to eat nourishing foods, and to tune in because we're not always in some fight, flight, or freeze mode just trying to survive. And I will say I have worked with a number of people who come through genocide. Um, it was more acute, but then they lived their lives in a chronic way, um, you know, not having an outer home. And they are some of the most embodied, empathic, loving human beings. Uh, creative, spiritually sound human beings, 
And part of it is they didn't have a lot of choice. They either had to wake up, connect up, both within, with each other, and with the spirit moving all their lives, or they were going to perish. So um, just another frame on it all. Um, so I want to speak about infancy cycle of life and technology and then move along a little bit. So technology, um, it's, it's, it's such an incredible thing that we can do what we're doing right now, have this conversation, and talk to people all over the world and share our um, thoughts and our feelings and our images. It's incredible, and it's made for a small world. But it's also caused great disconnect with our ground of being is a word, a phrase I like to use a lot. And um, it brings us up and out. It gives us other people's images on a constant basis. And it um, can easily seduce us and, sed and distract us every second of the day. And with our young children, I believe we have a spiritual mandate, a, a moral responsibility to not take the easy road out of putting them in front of TVs and computers and telephones. And, you know, certain parts around the world, there is, that's not even an option. They have a stick and a backyard with chickens running around. Or they have their mommy's back as their moms are working. Or who knows what they have. But we have so much access to this stuff. And children, young children, their first way of learning is through imitation. So what we are doing with our bodies, the, our posture, our, our way of regulating our nervous systems, um, our facial expressions, how we pace ourselves through the day, um, and how much time we spend in front of a screen really shapes how our children perceive reality. And um, yeah, it's seduce, it's seductive if all the adults around are always doing this. Why wouldn't a child want to do that? But what they're looking for is actually not going to be found there, not at all. And it does not give an upper edge on being thinkers later in life. And that's where I'm really, um, you know, I'm a Waldorf mom. I've taught in Waldorf schools. And I just feel like to allow the organic unfolding of the different developmental cycles of life is a beautiful thing. And if we can get in our bodies in those first seven years and then work with our heart forces in the second seven years, and I'll go there in a minute, and then really allow our thinking capacities to come online between that 14 and 21, then something can happen where the mind, the heart, and the body are hooked up and our soul forces can just, you know, just burst into flame. And, you know, that's my book, Youth on Fire, come into full color in, in that time around our 21st year. But if we come into our young adulthood or late adolescence trying to like, where's my body? What do I need? I don't know how to eat. I don't know what I'm hungry for. I'm tired. I can't rest. I'm, I'm high. I'm low. I'm out here all night long. It's going to be really tricky to have these natural developmental milestones um, happen. But it doesn't mean we can't repair it. And so many of us are living examples of that repair. So. According to Roth, Gabrielle Roth, the first developmental cycle and of Rudolf Steiner is that of coming into the body, which makes sense. We come from the spiritual world. We incarnate. We, there's, a, there's so much beautiful literature about all this. We start to gestate. We start to form into what we recognize as a human being. We come through these sacred waters into breath and into the world, and ideally we are received in love and nurtured and protected and cuddled in that as we slowly grow from the breast to the community, to the family. And the first layer of community is like grandma and grandpa and mom and dad and the earth and, and you know, our, our little friends and maybe our animals close. And um, if we're allowed to just be, to just be crawling and exploring and mm, coddling and all those good things. Bonnie Brainbridge Cohen offers so many teachings. Many do, but her work is particularly sophisticated around this early developmental stuff and all the new 
attunement and attachment stuff is too. If we can give that to our children and to ourselves and not rush that journey from the horizontal to the vertical, from the coddling and the crawling and the cooing to eventually the pushing up and the standing up, then when we stand up and become and access our vertical, we're ready for it. And all of a sudden, we're not just feeling our way through our senses, we can start to feel our way through our heart forces too. And the second developmental life cycle that, again, Gabrielle Roth, my life experience, and Steiner speak about is that of coming into relationship with our capacity to love. And with that grows our understanding of what it is to be a social and emotional being. And that's not we thinking about it. We are feeling it. We have sympathy. We have antipathy. I want to be your friend. I am angry about this. I'm crying about that. I'm, you know, loving you like I've never loved you before. I'm sad. I'm scared. It's just all this wonderful. Oh, uh, it doesn't mean that doesn't happen prior to this, but our developmental job is to learn how to exercise those muscles, those organs, so that we can come into relationship with people who are not here to just protect our being, but are actually starting to help us move into relationship with a larger world. And that's when, ideally, the the father and the father I was an awesome father until I wasn't and then my kids fired me as father but I was father and I had the job of taking my kids out into the world I also had the job of being mother and that gets complicated but hey I was into shape shifting so I did a pretty good job um I'll tell you later what my kids had to say when they were teenagers about my father but um remind me but um the father, and that can be played by an aunt or an uncle or a babysitter or whomever, their job is to begin to introduce the child to the world. And we start to go to kindergarten if all goes well, if we have those opportunities. And first grade and, and the playground becomes our, our, our place of great learning. And lots can happen in the classroom. Um, but the more we engage our our whole bodies, our whole beings, the more we can mobilize this, this, these love forces, our sympathy towards and our antipathy towards everything happening around us. And um, in, in, in great school systems, that would be the time that we're teaching our kids social and emotional skills. Uh, not from an overly intellectual place of, well, what are you feeling and how do you want to do that? But but giving people a way to express that. And theater is an amazing vehicle for that in the 7 to 14 years. And um, being out in the natural world and seeing and experiencing the night and the day and the sunrise and the sunset, it's like it just exercises our whole ah and ooh and the whole thing of life. And yes, we do need to learn how to communicate in a way that allows me to say, that scared me, or no thank you, or um, yes please. And the developmental repair work we can do around this is, is vast. And I turn to Marshall Rosenberg's work, I love it deeply, for understanding basic human emotions and the needs underneath them. And, um, and, and then how we can use our words to communicate. There are other wonderful, wonderful uh, bodies of work that Passage Work and Rachel Kessler's work has brought together other ways of just tending to the heart in the classroom and in the spaces between us. And, you know, I love all the circle work, the council work, and just learning how to be authentic and learning how to tell the truth and learning how to discern the truth. And I feel for those of us as adults who are working with young people, this is where um, they're learning they're learning through um, imagination. So we want to give them pictures that stimulate their capacity to to dream and to feel into life. and if we're if we're kind of saying one thing and doing another, something in them goes, "My world's not really safe. I don't really." trust you and we start to develop and 
and catalyze a distorted understanding of the truth. And we're seeing this all over the media now. And part of the power of being in the body, of being rooted in our body, is we get this sixth sense. Something tells me, yes, that all feels true. I'm hungry for, I know what my body wants, and I'm hungry for that, and I can reach towards it, and I'm going to feed that versus, uh, I know what I want, but I'm afraid to say it, and you're offering this, and you say it's good for me, but it feels bad, and so I'm going to starve, or I'm going to eat 12 of that, and we start to just get into all this dysregulated behavior, and then um, if there are adults who are not comfortable in their own heart, if they haven't processed their own anger at what happened to them in their childhood and their own grief, then when they get around the children, they really can't hold a space to help the young ones have develop right relationship with each other. And I mean, I have seen adults so betray the children at this developmental age. One saying, um, you know, we don't want to over intellectualize their feelings. And there is a place where we do that. It really is. But when a child, and I have seen this, is tied up on their playground by a group of boys, a little girl, tied up to the big dollhouse and, you know, and then teased or kids are teased because they dress differently or maybe they don't have the same food or they, you know, they may look like a boy but act like a girl. And there's no adults to help break that down and interrupt that kind of behavior. It is, it's it's an act of violence, actually, because what's happened is somebody in front of us has been violated, and we are not in there helping to let that person know that that's not their fault, that they are pure, they are innocent, they are whole, their feelings are valid, and that those who are behaving that way may actually be afraid, or they're trying to exercise an identity in ways that actually don't give them the experience that they're looking for. And they may need to go dig ditches and shovel gardens and feel their power in other ways rather than in some kind of oppressive, hurtful way for the for the less whatever child, you know, the kid who looks different than them on the playground. So there's a lot to be said here. We need to do our own developmental work, and that does happen in the body, in that place where the body and the heart are not separate. And we also need to learn skills for helping our children during that time of life. And I want to just say that every day I encounter children in that cycle of life. And, I'm, you know, I don't have kids at home that age. Um, and really what we need to offer them is an open heart and a reflection of, I love you. You're, a, you're beautiful. You're enough. I'm so glad you're here. And who knows, maybe they didn't get enough food before they came to school today or they heard mommy and daddy fighting or there is no daddy or daddy's in prison or, or you know, there was, mommy was on the phone the whole time driving to school or who knows what. But every moment is an opportunity to help a little one just relax back into themselves. And that's what allows the next generation to stay connected to their body or to begin to find their way back in. Because seated in this body is the source of our, of our intelligence, of our discernment, of our capacity to digest our meals. And um, if we are dysregulated in the body and, and our emotions, in our nervous system, and our um, heart forces, we can't think clearly. And then we start to get diagnosed as like, what's this child's problem? They're not paying attention in school. Or they have some kind of learning disability. I believe a lot of kids do, but part of it is that they are not helped in, in calming down and coming home so that they can sit still and pay attention and think freely. And none of us, none of us can think when we are overloaded with emotion in our bodies, or we're in a state of shock, something happened, and we're nowhere even near our bodies. And so I feel like the more of us as adults understand how to bring ourselves back from 
the evening news now. I mean, it's like it's not like something that happens out there. It's happening all around us. Somebody we know might be deported. Somebody we know um, couldn't get on their plane. Somebody we know just lost their job. Somebody we know isn't getting health insurance. We're all just, you know, being bounced around in a funny house, of sh a horror house of shocking news. So we as adults need to learn how to just, oh. and just even as I say that, I can imagine, I know what's happening in my body because I've developed the capacity to just go, go, go like this and stay very present, which is actually partially why I can speak like this. So I'm noticing in my belly, um, you know, just a lot of tightness and a lot of my glands are salivating. I can feel a little twitch in my eye. And I just, let's pause here and just take a minute, each of us. Ah, and just come home. We can put our hands on our body. What are the ways you resource in the moment? Just to do that and let your sweet little self know that little Melissa is talking up a storm. We all can continue to wake up and heal our lives and and above all, know that we're enough and stay present right here. And I find that appreciation is such a glorious way to help myself. I go, okay, it's all good. So if there's some little message like, yeah, you've done a, a really good job eating today. Or that you're appreciating that... Um, staying in contact with yourself through touch or um, that you're taking notes and not just you're letting yourself get only as much as you actually need from my little chat here just to check in and see where you are and your breath you need to get up and just move a little bit my big resource I love to move my body and kids do too. Why would we sit children down in desks all day and then tell them there's something wrong with them? They are humans in these brilliantly expressive forms. So please take your inner child, take your little children, take your neighbor's kids and move with them. You know, make up, make up songs, turn everything into theater. You know, you're cooking, turn, you know, when the, when the, cookies are in the oven you know let's be little cookies and let's grow or let's be popcorn and pop around the house or you know I mean I brought everything we did to life and you don't need to be a trained teacher to do that but you do need to love to play and if you don't love to play that's okay um, you know we have tears to shed and fears to befriend and anger to express but after that there's a lot of play in all of us and play helps us um, really heal that child spirit so that we can um, move into the great play of life, which as we move out of the childhood cycle of life, we move into the adolescent cycle of life. And, um, you know, our playground move, moves from the womb to the family to the school to the larger community. And ideally, we're met with adults and opportunities that inspire us, that make us long to become all we can be. And sadly, that's not what we're met with so much of the time. We may have one aunt that's like so cool, or we may have one teacher who sees us, or we may have seen something on TV, someone making music or sending a message that, it, that was like, whoa, that spoke to me. But, or we may have, um, a friend that we just love so much if we're lucky or we know that the golden sun just gives us a little bit of consolation as we walk across the railroad tracks whatever um, young people desperately need to be inspired they need to be uplifted in fact there's a wiring in adolescence that young people need transcendent experiences that give them a sense that they're part of a bigger story not just their own humdrum, go to school, get a job, da 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 da, da. Um, that there are options for them and there are things that take them up out of themselves and open vistas to a greater, a greater uh, story 
the mystery, the majesty, the beauty, the aha. And there's a thousand ways to offer that to kids without drugs, actually. Um, and some of them look like, you know, terrorist organizations. Come, have an adventure, you know, travel to foreign lands, be part of a group. Ah, that's the other thing kids need. Adolescents need to feel part of, they need that social engagement and intimacy and sense of belonging in a very different way than children. It's a different kind of thing. They are longing to, to commune with the other, with that outside themselves. So, you know, if we don't give them positive alternatives, they're going to find these really, really destructive ones. So, you know, take them into the natural world. If, if there's an opportunity to go interact with another culture through theater, through dance performances, through travel, those are awesome ones. And for me, the one that my life is devoted to is giving myself, that wild creative part of myself, um, you know, the turn to drugs and sex, honestly looking for something bigger. Um, and other risk behaviors like hitchhiking across the country by myself a number of times, putting myself in ridiculous situations. Okay. Hi. The universe is um, They're calling. <laughs> or, you know, there we are, teenagers and cell phones. Oh, my goodness. I'll do a rant on that in a minute. But I just want to say this. Um, for me, the arts have been the way to access my deepest truths to express what ails me and what calls and what awes me and to um, literally reorganize myself so that I was not just in my contracted self but I could access my expanded self and I truly believe that there's a blueprint inside of each of us that gives us keys to our life's work and adolescent is the time to begin to really learn to read the clues of our lives. What have been our challenges? We don't need to deny them. We need to befriend them. And what are the opportunities and, that are coming towards us? Who are the people that are in our presence? And if, um, you know, we don't have any contact, we are going to implode or we're going to explode. We need ways to really express. And so, like I said, the arts, and in particular dance and singing, but in particular dance has been my way to do that. So, um, you know, take your, take your creative wild self on dates all the time and um, let nothing stand between you and that. And, um, you know, yoga is beautiful. It helps us come back in and have the discipline. That's another piece of the childhood cycle. We learn to have discipline. We learn to be disciples of our teachers. And that can carry on through adolescence. And I really feel that during that time to give our young people opportunities to study a form and to be formed as they're going through this revolution within is, is like essential. They have devotion to their sensei, to their teacher. They have devotion to the discipline itself. And, and it also helps uh, shape them in a way that is dignified, that is upright, that is inspired. Their breath can move through them, whether it's yoga or tai chi or, or fencing or, or so many dance forms or theater, whatever it is, there's, there are other forms too. So um, I'm just going to move. How are we with time? Oh my God, are we almost at, we're almost at an hour. Take as much time as you want, but can I ask you a question? Wait, can Which, I just finish one thing? Yeah, yes. let me just see if I can find it. Um, I just want to finish this piece about adolescence. Or no, I'll pick it back up. You go ahead, Liz. Well, I'm just, one of the things that we've talked a, a lot about here in this course, but in, in a lot of the other courses that I teach too, is how yoga is particularly uniquely placed for a kind of, um, well, twofold. One is like, there are plenty of folks like myself who started yoga at, as a teenager, as 16, because it's poised as a discipline, but also 
providing an opportunity for the experience of um, a transcendent experience. And then I've also, we also talk a lot about how um, as adults who may not have been given that opportunity in the past, there are the practices like yoga, like dance, that there's that longing to have that completion of our adolescence. And so we keep finding ourselves in practices that might repair that opportunity that we didn't otherwise get. And so then there are those of us who are yoga teachers and we're teaching a room of adults, but we're not, well, physical adults, but we're not actually teaching adults. We're teaching adolescents. You might be teaching infants, you might be teaching children too, uh, because it's right. really all about self-love. And right. um, for those of us who are working in those rooms, this, for us to stay very curious about not only where people have breakthroughs, but where people get stuck. And for me, working with the rhythms, I can watch a body in motion. I can hear a voice. I can see how somebody walks. I can look at the right and left side of the body. And I can start to guess, not be certain, to guess some things about their biography. If they're super comfortable and flowing and don't want to leave, there could be a lot of reasons for it. It could be that they um, just had so much mommy energy, but no one ever came along to take them into the world and move them from being into action. Or um, people who. Um, you know, are just so serious and disciplined and, you know, but actually are, um, and there, I love discipline. I'm a very disciplined person in some ways, but I've also had to learn to really make room for my own flow. And it's like, well, today I didn't practice. And that's actually a very fertile space to be in. Or um, today I ate cookies and they were really good. And I really am curious why I needed cookies today. Am I in some cycle of my, some phase of my menstrual cycle? Or um, did I just need something sweet? Or am I trying to shove something down? And, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a cookie. When we start to get to three and four, then I'm like really paying attention. Um, so um, I went off on a little side road there, but I do think it's actually important. Um, so I think the thing to do is what yoga and dance and these forms do is they teach us to see and to listen. They teach us, they give us a structure for us to be with ourselves. And we don't want to be with ourselves as um, indulgent lushes, and we don't want to be with ourselves as fascists. But it all becomes a big mirror. And so what are we noticing? What are we noticing? We're always holding our left shoulder, you know, or that there's a certain tightness or certain organs. And we just get to study our bodies and be with them and track them. And they will tell us about what we need. And if we follow that, they will continue to heal and awaken and not only tell us what we need, but tell us what people around us might need or what the world needs. They will become conduits not only of our own healing, but conduits of an intelligence that dwells in our cells and our organs that is beyond ourselves. So there, so these disciplines are about healing ourselves, but also helping ourselves become instruments to heal others. And, um, you know, the bottom line is no judgment. Be kind to these bodies. Be kind to your fragility. Listen to the vulnerable places. And and I, I recently I had such I was so proud of myself. I I was getting a massage and I leaned down. There was somebody next to my locker and I was being all nice. And I leaned down to move my shoes. And I really didn't need to do that, but I was being all nice. And I came up full. And I hit my head right like this on, on, on that locker, like full power. And, you know, I just had a massage and I really needed that experience. And I was in, I was, I was in blinding pain and I kind of went running out of the room because I definitely didn't want to deal with that person who probably was feeling terrible. And, um, 
I ran into this other room and I just was holding my head and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And along came this person who I knew. And rather than me doing what I always do, I, I just said, I really need your help. Can you get me some ice? I just hit my head. And in that moment, she said, of course. And then I just burst into the deepest tears. I just wailed. And, and then it was like the ice came and I was put it on there and I was so done. You know, the, I was taking care of my physical body. My emotional body had had an authentic release. I was so proud of myself just not being all stoic and like not troubling anybody, including myself, but really letting myself melt into the vulnerability of it and complete it, sequence the charge through of having hurt myself. And that was a teeny little thing. I actually still have a bruise. Um, it was a teeny little thing, but we don't let ourselves do that. And so I want to put a good plug in for all of us on the path of embodiment that as we get older, our bodies change. As we have children, as we go through menopause, I just came through menopause and it was a ride. It was like going through adolescence again, except um, I'm supposed to be like the older person and I had to revisit some adolescent stuff. And I don't want to skip over the whole adulthood because I know I sort of left us at adolescence. I'm going to say a couple of things to build that bridge. But I had to just be like, yeah, my body's changing and um, my sex drive is changing. And I've got these wrinkles and, and you know, and I, I had this vision before I went into menopause that I was who I was going to be coming out. And it was really helpful. Because I think that is who I'm becoming coming out. And it was really cool. It was just helped me. Like this betwixt and between state is not forever. So get into it. And I would say that about all life transitions. Whether you know, you're in that glorious moment of the bride. Or in that awkward moment of postpartum. Or that you know, there's so many awkward moments <laughs> growing as women in a body. Or as humans in a body. Um, you know, our first wet dream as a boy. Um, Ah, what's happening here and how do I go about walking out into the world with this thing happening, you know, below my waist? Um, for us to just give ourselves so much permission because I don't think our consciousness comes through by overriding or by being dictators with these bodies. And some people do yoga. We all do to some degree to be beautiful, to be the most gloriously visually whatever person we can be shiny but um but there's a deeper thing here which is becoming more human and um that's one of the reasons i love i'm going to just finish this loop really quickly i love working with creativity before studying our fertility and teaching and opening into our our fertility and our intimacy and our sexuality because our creativity can be with us, even in dying. My dear beloved mentor, Tamara Slayton, in her dying, she was in the last maybe month or two of her dying. She had these huge murals. She would turn her back to anybody who would come see us. Her, and she would turn and she was painting these murals of angels. Now, we all knew what she was doing. She was going, preparing to be in the spiritual world. Her body, she couldn't even really cry. I mean, I would visit her and I would just wail. And I knew that it was my tears and hers. Her body was so weakened. But she had enough stamina to make art. And I just believe that we can make art at every life cycle. We can make art in how we dress and how we eat and what we do with our hands and how we da-da-da, the whole thing. Um, but, you know, our fertility changes and our desire for intimacy expands and contracts. And our sexual energy, our eros, is always here, but it doesn't always want to go towards the act of love, physical lovemaking. Um, and so I like to really honor that as what comes in late adolescence and into adulthood and carries us through adulthood. And there's, you know, we could spend another 20 hours talking about these many subtleties of the adult journey. Um, but I do want to say that our our job is to, as Gabrielle Roth said, be a teaching, to turn our life into gold, to take everything we are given 
and eat it so fully and alchemize it so deeply that we can offer it back to the world as something more beautiful than it came to us. And that that's our spiritual mandate. And, and Lord knows I've been tested with that. And, you know, dirty little secrets. I've, I've buried a partner. I've been through divorce. I've raised kids alone who said to me, you sucked as a father. You know, like you, you, we did need a dad and we also needed a mom. And sometimes you were so busy being dad that you weren't mom. And, you know, I had to eat that. I also, they needed a dad more than they needed a mom. The times I had to like, rawr, go protect them from the whatever. Um, so, you know, there's been plenty of ups and downs on this journey, but to be able to ride them from an embodied place and use everything as a doorway to know, to, to know and excavate more intelligence is, is a life path. And I'm blessed to have had great teachers and great students who actually are paying attention, and that motivates me, but mostly just a love of the gift of life. And, and you know, obviously we all prefer to have safety and pleasure. It took me a while to prefer pleasure over pain, truth be. And we want that for ourselves and our families and our communities and all peoples. Um, but, but we don't, that's not what's going on. So how can we learn to stay grounded, to do, to meet life in a posture of openness and, um, and to become a force that, in, that invites and inspires others to do the same. To me, that's the journey of what adulthood's all about. And, you know, every day is precious because we don't know how, how many we have or how long we have our good health. So in that spirit, you know, as we start to let go of the body to do so with the same grace that we have um, opened into it and transformed it and delighted in it and eventually we'll release it and i'll just close with this picture that rudolf Steiner gives us that the first 30 35 years are about incarnating where the spirit is descending into matter and infusing itself in matter, in, in matter, Mother Earth. And that from 35 out, we are beginning to excarnate, to actually slowly leave this blessed temple. And my deepest prayer is that we actually understand it as a temple, as a gift that we can put the lights on in and, um, and pray and celebrate through and um, in the spaces between us. So in deep devotion to the head, the heart, and the will, and to all of creation, I say thank you, Livia. It's such a joy <laughs> to talk about what I love most. And thank you for listening, all of you. And, um, you know, I can be found on www.goldenbridge.org, but mostly get yourself found and um, know your version of what I've been able to digest and alchemize in my life. Just may all of it be done in peace for all peoples and our precious planet. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I'll make sure everyone gets the right places to find you and, um, and all of that. Love you so much. It's really fun. Mm -hmm. Okay. Peace, you all. Go do it. Let's see what we can do to help this crazy place. Damn. <laughs>